So I'm going to talk about the problem statement. We are currently the most overweight, most depressed, most medicated, and most addicted cohort of adults that there's ever been. Not necessarily in this room. I'm talking about as a population. Yet life has never been so good. We have it easier than all of our ancestors, yet we are going through what can only be described as a twin physical and mental health crisis. Right now, in this country and across the ditch where I live, one in two adults is living, or sorry, one in two people is living with a chronic disease, not one in two adults. Once you hit my age north of 50, it is the norm to have multiple chronic diseases. Right now, one in five Australians and Kiwis is living with a mental health issue, and lifetime prevalence of mental illness sits at around 50%. That means that one in two people statistically in this room will develop a mental illness at some stage in their life, yet life has never been so good. So clearly, something is wrong with the way that we're living modern life. And for me, a lot of it comes down to this picture. This is what your genome and my genome is wired for, being a hunter-gatherer. Probably my favorite research quote in any journal I've ever read, other than some of Grant's, is from a professor uh, uh, it was in the Journal of Applied Physiology, 2012, Professor Frank Booth. In this paper, he was talking about the human genome. Here's what he said. He said, the human genome has not changed in over 45,000 years. The current human genome requires and expects us to be highly physically active for normal functioning. Note the way he said normal, not optimal. Yet we don't move very much anymore. He also talked about nutrition, the fact that for all of our species, apart from the blink of an eye the last 30 to 50 years, we've eaten stuff that has been alive recently. Now more than 50% of calories that we eat in Australia and New Zealand are ultra-processed shit. And it's killing us, and it's killing our kids. He also talked about our stress response system which has evolved in our species to deal with certain challenges. Think of three minutes of screaming terror on the African savanna when your ancestors are being chased by a lion. That activates our stress response system. But now with modern life, we have lots of novel stressors. So I'm gonna show you a five second movie about modern life. And I just wanna see if anybody relates to this. Oh, fuck! <laughs> Who's had a day like that? Like lots of days like that, right? So it's this insane busyness that we have, this hamster wheel that we're on. What we now know is that stress is the major driver of chronic disease, both physical disease and mental disease. This paper um, really dove, dove into that like nobody any, anywhere before. And, and, and they have this model that some may be familiar with, but they've added some new terminology. So here, this is the healthy baseline homeostasis that Davis talked about. Then whenever we're stressed, we go into catabasis, and then anabasis, where we're recovering. When we get to eustasis, that, that basically translates as a good state. That's where we recover homeostasis, right? But this catastatic load, or cacostasis, is where we don't recover, and this is where disease happens. Now, resilience is all about bouncing back and getting to here. I think that underplays what we're capable of. We are capable of hyperstasis, an elevated state, because of exposure to stress and then appropriate recovery. And that's really what my PhD is zoning in on. But now, the answer seems to be for particularly higher education, lots of universities and in workplaces, we'll just give people trigger warnings. We'll just let them remove themselves from stress, from being offended, and it doesn't work. In fact, the research shows it is making stuff worse. Trigger warnings put people in a hypervigilant state, and they often avoid stuff, and it's even been shown that it doesn't work with individuals for trauma. And I'm talking about capital T trauma, not the diluted trauma that a lot of people talk about today. We are diluting words and we are sensitizing people um, to discomfort. What I believe that we need is stress fitness. And here's my definition along with Eugene Edmund, my PhD supervisor. So the malleable, that is trainable. 
ability to engage, switch on, maintain and extinguish the stress response and flexibly adapt to physical and mental challenges and or advantages to enhance tolerance and or performance. So note that there's a psychological and a physiological component to this. And, and why I'm using the term stress fitness, everybody gets that physical fitness is on a continuum. You can be low physically fit, moderate and high, but you've got to work at it. Everybody knows that. And everybody knows that if you're not working at it, if you stop, you slide back down the continuum, and that's like stress fitness. So I'm going to go through just some stuff. I'm going to majorly focus on, on, on the physiology today and, to, and, and tomorrow go into a bit more depth of the psychology around stuff. Firstly, and, and I think most importantly, is about mobilizing your metabolism. So this is physical activity. And I said earlier on, we don't move very much compared to our ancestors. So this is, is looking at research from a bunch of Harvard professors who went and studied the Hadza. They are one of the last true hunter-gatherer tribes on Earth. They live in Tanzania in East Africa. And at the time of the study, more than 90% of all the food they got was from hunting and gathering. So this is the best snapshot into what our human genome is designed for. Remember, we still got a hunter-gatherer's genome. And what they found, so they, they put physical activity monitors on them. They wanted to do their steps, but they also put heart rate monitors on them. Now, who's got a physical activity tracker? Anybody? What's the magic number of steps a day? So 10,000 steps a day. Most people don't get that. The average in Australia, New Zealand, most developed nations is about 5,000 steps a day. Here's what they find. Hadza women and girls, this is a comparison to 111 nations in modern societies. Hadza women and girls move more than double the amount of women and girls in modern society. And Hadza men and boys, three to four times the amount uh, of physical activity in terms of steps, right? But then with heart rate monitors, they also looked at moderate to vigorous physical activity. Like what was the intensity of it? This is why we don't have recommendations around steps because intensity is really important. Now, in this country and across the ditch, UK, very, very similar across the world, the guidelines are 150 to 300 minutes of moderate physical activity every day, or 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous, so it's a two for one, and including a couple of strength training sessions spread over five days a week, right? Most Kiwis and Australian adults don't hit the bottom number of 150 minutes of moderate a week. The Hadza do 945 minutes of combined moderate to vigorous physical activity every week. They move seven to 10 times the amount in terms of intensity of the average Australian or the average Kiwi. And when you understand the impact of exercise on your biology, it becomes very clear why we're struggling with such disease. Um, it has been shown that exercise can prevent and or treat 26 of the most common chronic diseases. Can you imagine if the food pharmaceutical industry created a pill that could do that? How much would that shit sell? Would anybody buy that stuff? So what we need to understand, and we all know that exercise is good for your mood. Who knew that? Right? And why? What does exercise release in your brain that is good for your mood, not you, Grant? Endorphins, everybody knows about endorphins, and they're important, but your monamines do most of the heavy lifting. Serotonin, dopamine, noradrenaline. Now, not only are they important mood-enhancing chemicals, they're also what we call neuromodulators. So they have widespread effects throughout your brain and your nervous system. We also have endocannabinoids released when we exercise. So every time we're exercising, there's this whole neural symphony of stress that is happening in your brain, and that's just in the brain. Now, most people get that exercise is good for your mood, but I want to take you back to that quote from Professor Frank Booth. The current human genome requires and expects us to be highly physically active for normal functioning. If we're not highly physically active, we are depriving our brains of the neurotransmitters that it needs to function normally. Does that make sense to people? And we know that exercise is a powerful driver of your gene expression. Every time you exercise, there are three waves of gene expression. I've spoken to thousands of people over the years about exercise. Some people say to me, yes, I'm into it. Others go, I don't like it because it makes me uncomfortable. 
And my response to them is, it's supposed to be bloody uncomfortable. That is why exercise is good for you, because it's a stressor. And it activates stress response genes, um, heat shock proteins, that get inside your cells, released inside your cells, and they fix the molecular damage. But then there's another wave of gene expression called metabolic priority genes that just make your metabolism function better in both your body and your brain. And then another wave of gene expression, David talked about your mitochondria, mitochondrial enzyme genes that get in and repair those mitochondria. And we know that high intensity interval training induces mitochondrial biogenesis, which is a bit of a mouthful that basically means brand spanking new batteries for your, your cells throughout your body and your brain, helping to combat those four horsemen that David talked about. But the other thing that's important to know, if we think of exercise as medicine, we now understand the ingredients. And the ingredients are called myokines. And I call them magical myokines. These are these awesome messenger molecules. First one that was discovered 50 or 60 years ago. Uh, and we knew that myokines inside the muscle helped the model to re-muscle, become bigger, faster, stronger. We now know that they secrete out of the muscle and they have a positive impact on every single organ and organ system in your body. Improve the health of your immune system, your stress response system, even enhance your gut microbiome, or your entire gastrointestinal tract. They help your liver to dispose of glucose, your pancreas to release insulin. They remodel bone and blood vessels throughout your life. And then in the brain, they help to grow and repair brain cells through BDNF, which is triggered by myokines arisen and actually lactate, shuttling across the blood-brain barrier and triggering that BDNF. So every time you're exercising, by the way, we've now identified more than 600 myokines. We only know what about 60 of them do, and they do all of that stuff. So the, the last thing I want to talk about with exercise is that we need to view it not just as a stressor, but a modifier of stress. Here's a study that I love. They took a bunch of people, put them through 30-minute stress battery. So this is a reliable stress battery that induces psychological stress and reliably produces a cortisol response. Here you can see fit, active people in the bottom, and at the top are unfit, inactive. You don't need to be a research scientist to decode that, do you? What this tells you is that fitter people handle psychological stress better. And this supports the cross-stressor effect. Not cross-dresser, that's what I used to do in the military. Cross-stressor is that if you expose yourself to the stress of exercise, not only do you enhance your ability to deal with the stress of exercise, but you enhance your ability to deal with psychological stress. Military have just noticed this by training soldiers. The British military have been doing it for a thousand years. And they know that fitter soldiers handle psychological stress better. That is why basic training is a lot of physical stuff, because they know that it helps. Anybody convinced yet about the benefits of exercise? I can do this shit all day long. Right. Let me now talk about something a bit more left field. Right. Cold showers. It's always a bit of a groan. Who does them? Who does them all year round? Oh, it's quite a few. Right. Those who don't, why not? Because you're all going, it's cold, you dickhead. What are you even asking for, right? <laughs> so this was the research paper that convinced me to have a cold shower every time I have a shower for the rest of my life. It's about seven years ago, I haven't missed one yet. Let's just pretend we're doing it here. We, let's say you're randomly seated. We'd say, right, you guys on the left, just do your normal shower. You guys on this side, we want you to turn it to cold at the end of your normal shower for a minimum of 30 seconds, right? So, sorry? <laughs> sorry, my, my right, right? So you're off the hook, you're on the hook. Now, and they followed them for a year. They measured their health, their sickness, and their absenteeism. And at the end of the year, they found that these guys had a 29% reduction in sickness and absenteeism. You try and find me a workplace wellness program that does that, right? So before I get into the science of it, I want to introduce you to my little dudes, right? 
So this is Oscar, and he looks like this for two reasons. Number one, we were just back from Bali. He doesn't normally have that shit in his hair. But he has this expression on his face because he's about three seconds into a freezing cold shower in the Mornington Peninsula in Victoria in the middle of winter. Now, before anybody phones child protection services on me, <laughs> the reason he's in that shower is that I read that research paper, and I went, holy shit, this is really compelling. I need to run some experiments like a good scientist, <laughs> right? So I ran an experiment. It's not what you're thinking. I actually used myself. I got into the shower that day, and I said, right, 30 seconds. And remember, it's winter. And I'm psyching myself up to turn it to cold. I'm just about to turn it to cold. Don't know if anybody relates to this. This little voice came in my head, and it went, hold on a minute. It's winter. <laughs> This is your first cold shower. You don't have to do 30 seconds, just do 15. And I am rather embarrassed to admit I gave in to my little weak inner voice. And I thought, right, 15 seconds, and I turned it to cold just as Oscar happened to walk into the bathroom, right? So you got a picture of the scene. I'm in the shower, Oscar walks in, and all of a sudden I start to go, Hadza! and he's kind of looking at me going, what are you doing, Dad? I'm like, I'm having a cold shower, buddy. He's like, okay, what are you doing that for? And I couldn't really think of any at the time. I just went, because it makes you tough. And he went, oh, really? <laughs> and so it got to the end of my 15 seconds. Oscar's still standing there. And he went, how long did you do, Dad? I said, I did 15 seconds, mate. He said, get out. I'm going to kick your ass. <laughs> So I got out and Oscar got in and I said, right, mate, go. I had my phone because I was timing myself and I waited a couple of seconds and then I took this photo just as it turns cold, right? So this is Oscar three seconds in and this is him 30 seconds in. <laughs> and he just kicked into a technique called box breathing, something I taught him for competing in karate but didn't think to use and he just went straight into it. Got the 30 seconds. I said, Mike, mate, you're done. He stopped the shower and he walked out like this. Loser. <laughs> so we started a little competition that has now culminated in ice baths, right? But this is not the point here. I'm just going to show you. I'm going to go through this slide just because of time really quickly. Um, so here is, there's about 50 research papers behind this slide, um, which are all in my book. And um, when you have cold, regular cold water exposure, you get improved metabolic health, your antioxidant defense system goes up, your microbiome activity goes up, you get decreased inflammation, improved mood and cognition because you get a massive increase in adrenaline, no, sorry, noradrenaline and dopamine. You get a mitochondrial biogenesis in your muscle and in some of your fat, turning it brown because there's more mitochondria, which means it helps with weight loss. And then we know that when you turn the, the thermostat the other way, and expose yourself to a sauna, or getting in a hot bath for 20 minutes can do similar, maybe not as intense, you get all of these different benefits. What is the common link between heat exposure, cold exposure, and exercise? Stress response proteins, right? This is about getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. These are evolutionarily conserved mechanisms. You see it in fruit flies, in, in rats and mice, in monkeys, in humans. When they're exposed to these things, they get upregulation of protective genes that actually has a net positive because of being exposed to intermittent amounts of stress. Does that make sense? So let me now go and talk about nutrition. Now, I, I could spend all day talking about nutrition. Lots of people will, so I'm going to do it very, very quickly. I'm just going to give you my take on it. For me, nutrition's a little bit about, like, religion, right? Think of it this way. There's lots of different religious practices around the world, just like there's lots of different eating practices, right? Paleo, high-fat, low-carb, low-fat, high-carb, vegetarian, vegan, carnivore, all of this stuff. Now, with every religion, you have some people who kind of loosely adhere to it, a bit like nutrition, and then you have some people who are very, very strict, and then with every single religion, there is a very small component of fundamentalist extremists who harass people and criticize them who don't do what they do. And it's the same with nutrition. And the worst are the fucking vegans. <laughs> and I know I'm just insulting. I'm only joking. I'm only joking. No, I'm not. <laughs> 
Anybody who tells you there's one diet that we should all be eating is either demented or they're trying to sell you something or they're a member of a cult. <laughs> My take on nutrition is just simple. The most important thing that people need to do is eat a low HI diet, where HI stands for human interference, right? Basically, if you're looking at a piece of food, you can see that it's been alive recently, it's grown out of the ground off a bush or a tree, run around on four legs or swam, and it's been minimally interfered with by humans, eat it. Don't worry about the bloody fat, the carbohydrate, the protein, just eat it. However, if you're looking at a piece of food and you're going, Mr. Krispy Kreme Donut, I don't remember seeing you running around on four legs. <laughs> then it's in your treat food, right? And I'm not saying you should go extreme. I think that's unhealthy, right? 80-20 rule. That's the rule that we practice in our house. Roughly 80% of the stuff, not calorie count, just roughly, um, should be, have been alive recently and minimally interfered with by humans, and the other 20% is your treat. And enjoy your treats. If it's chocolate, ice cream, buy the best damn quality that you can afford and enjoy that stuff but trying to keep it around 20%. Now, this is actually backed up with this stuff around NOVA. Who's familiar with the NOVA classification? I think this is the best nutritional guide that's ever been devised, right? So it talks about raw and minimally processed food, low HI, processed coloring ingredients, then processed foods like canned fish, canned fruit, canned vegetables, sardo bread, artesian breads, and, and then things like cheese and yogurt. And then all the other stuff's the ultra processed stuff. Now, Here's the issue. In the United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and the UK, more than 50% of calories consumed are ultra-processed foods and drinks. And the research shows that, it, it, and there's more and more research. I've got about 40 to 50 research papers on the health risks of ultra-processed foods. These two studies, big studies, over 100,000 people. Now, they're observational. There's obviously issues. But when you understand the mechanisms um, and you put that, layer that over the top of the observational studies, then we start to get reasonable evidence, right? And what they found, so they compared these studies to people who had 20% or less, as you typically see in France, Spain, and Italy, where they're into real food, right? And what they found is that going from 20% to 30% increased the risk of every single cancer and every form of cardiovascular disease by more than 10%, right? So this study showed, and there's other studies showing that, that um, you, once you hit 50%, you double your risk of mental illness. Double, right? And this study here on all-cause mortality, this should be on the front of every bloody newspaper. More than four serves daily, which is roughly about that 50% threshold, 62% increased hazard for all-cause mortality. That is like smoking 40 cigarettes a day. And the average person in this country and across the ditch does that, right? This is the biggest issue with nutrition, I believe, is the ultra-processed food and drinks. And here, for those people who like visual stuff, now, I wish they'd put them into quartiles. They kind of jumped them together. That's the lowest half, and that's the top half. Notice you don't see the difference in death rates for about 10 years, and then it starts to go massive. And as this goes longer and longer, you'll see it bigger and bigger. Chronic disease doesn't happen over a year. It's a slow de destroying or degrading of metabolism, and that's how this stuff is actually having its impact. Now, we talked about mental health. Professor Felice Jacka, who is an absolute gun, I've had her on my podcast, took a bunch of people who were majorly depressed. Not like I'm a bit sad, major depression. They were all on drugs and psychotherapy. She split them into two groups randomly and assigned one half to a modified Mediterranean diet, right? So the typical diet of Crete, but she modified it, more red meat. Why? Because if you're depressed, Red meat is really good for your brain because it's high in B vitamins, it's high in zinc, it's high in iron and other nutrients that tend to be low in a depressed brain. And she found a 500% um, increased rate of remission in those who had the nutritional intervention versus those who were on drugs and psychotherapy alone. That is massive. That and other studies by her have changed psychiatry. 
you, the, the whole nutritional psychiatry movement. Now, the recommendations of your psychiatrist in Australia and New Zealand, and the first line of treatment for mood disorders is no longer medication. It is now lifestyle intervention, right? Which we are all well placed to help people um, with that, those interventions. The other thing I will say about nutrition, this is another landmark study produced out of Stanford last year. Took a bunch of people who were on the SAD diet, standard American diet, right? Uh, and they, they basically split them into two groups. One half went on a high fiber diet. They introduced it gradually. The other half high per fermented foods. That, and they measured markers of inflammation. Uh, and they also looked at their gut microbiome. And they were expecting to see the high fiber diet doing really well and, and had some benefit from the ment fermented foods. And it was the opposite. On the high fiber diet, some people did really well. Some people, their inflammation went up went through the roof, right? And they now I think it was because from eating a shit diet, they destroyed their microbiome. And they destroyed the stuff that particularly fermented, fermented fiber. So the recommendations from this study is adding fermented food first because that seems to sow the seeds for a healthy microbiome and then bring the fiber into it, right? Does that make sense to people? Um, now, and this is, I, I created this chart uh, and, and used this um, with my clients. And it's basically trying to eat 40 different foods, of which 10 are animal foods, so 30 plant-based foods. So if you're vegetarian or vegan, just go straight to the 30, and all of those colors. Because one of the major issues with the microbiome, ours are much more narrow. There are lots of people, who, who, who eats healthy in this room? Right? Who eats a reasonably similar diet week on week? Right? And that's a problem. Right? We all think that this is a great diet, but when you're eating same, 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 you've got lots of some microbiome, but you're missing out a lot. You look at the Hadza, their microbiome is way more diverse than ours. Right? So it's diversity, lots of colors, lots of different foods. You'll find you'll need to use herbs and spices to hit those 40 foods as well. Um, so you need to really um, get adventurous with the diet, which is what we should be doing. So now let me um, talk about recovering at well. Um, so I'm going to break this into two different buckets, right? Micro recovery and macro recovery. So micro recovery is stuff that you do lots of times throughout the day. Um, and so a couple of things I want to focus on. Um, so one is around workplace. And when people are, 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 are busy, they fall into the trap of just pushing on and pushing on, going through lunch. I just need to get through this. I just need to get through this, right? Um, and what they don't realize is you become less and less effective as you continue to do that. That's not the way our biological rhythms actually work. Um, it's been shown that taking breaks improves performance as well as well-being, right? I'm a massive fan of the Pomodoro technique. So use this when you're in control of your own diary, right? Is basically you work in 30-minute cycles. Um, set an alarm for 25 minutes. Turn off distractions. Give me some distractions. So cell phones. Um, is that an American in the room? Mobile phones. Uh, mo cell phones or mobile phones, email, Microsoft Teams, that sort of shit. Turn it off, right? What we know, the brain drain study showed that if your mobile phone is on the table, upside down, turned on silent, it reduces your working memory capacity and your fluid intelligence by at least 10%, right? These are intention thieves. So it's turning that stuff off, doing 25 minutes of deep work, then have a five minute break. What would you do first thing in that five minute break? Get off your arse, right? Get off your arse and move, you've all felt what a 30 second sprint does. Blood flow and oxygen to your brain. And if you've had a stressful day, you're burning up stress hormones and helping to come back to homeostasis, right? Then it's about drinking a glass of water because lots of people walk around chronically dehydrated and that kills brain function quicker than anything else. And then it's about doing some breath work. Now 10 years ago, I used to think that breath work was fluffy bullshit, right? Um, I don't think there's anything else to, that I have moved so far around um, in the last decade. Now, David talked about the autonomic nervous system and the balance of our autonomic nervous system. 
And we now know when you're in sympathetic dominance, so your autonomic nervous system, two sides of a seesaw, sympathetic and parasympathetic. I don't know who called it sympathetic, David, because it's not very sympathetic. That's the stress response, right? Parasympathetic is rest and digest. We now know, so the vagus nerve, which drives parasympathetic nervous system, has got projections through to the heart, lungs, and pretty much all your visceral organs. But, and, and, and we can measure with what's called vagal tone, right? So if you've got high vagal tone, your parasympathetic is in good shape. If you've got low vagal tone, you're basically stressed. One of the best ways that you can measure it is heart rate variability. And it's available to everybody, right? All of these watches will do heart rate variability. If you don't have a watch or you want to get really good on it, I recommend you spend 130 bucks and buy a Polar H10 monitor and, and get a free app called Elite HRV and just get your waking heart rate variability, right? That gives you a kind of a readiness indication and looking at that trend over time that when it starts to drop, you need to take action, right? Because if my parasympathetic, if my, my heart rate variability is lower, actually, let me take a step back for those who are not familiar with it. Let's say I have a resting heart rate of 60 beats a minute. Most people think it should be one beat a second, metronomic, right? If that's the case, I'm either not recovered from a really hard workout or stressful day or week. And then if it's the case over the period of a couple of weeks, um, it's saying that I'm, I'm sick or very stressed. And if it's the period over months, it's one of the best predictors of impending heart attacks, having consistently low heart rate variability. What we now know is that you can influence it through breathing. That with doing long, slow breathing, control breathing, you actually activate the vagus nerve and the phrenic nerve from the bottom up you reduce your heart rate, optimize heart rate variability, reduce your blood pressure, and bring your brain out of a stress state. So a couple of ways to do it. Box breathing, anybody familiar with it? Used by US Special Forces soldiers when they're on patrol. Anybody who knows anything about Special Forces guys knows they don't do fluffy bullshit. They do stuff that has been demonstrated to give them a performance edge. I, I am a better fan, bigger fan of, of resonant frequency breathing. Now, you need expensive equipment to work yours out, but everybody in this room is between about five and seven breaths a minute. That is a, is a frequency of breathing that connects the heart, the lungs, and the brain. It's called resonance breathing. And research shows you get plus or minus one, you get the vast majority of the benefits. So it's six breaths a minute for the lay person, right? And, and, and you can either do five and five. A recent study showed that people who use that actually have less amyloid plaque accumulation in their brains, which drives Alzheimer's. Pretty cool shit, right? I'm a bigger fan. We know that to optimize it, the breath out should be at least one and a half times the breath in, right? So breathing in for four, out for six is, is really going to optimize it. Because as you breathe in, you, very, um, uh, you have a, a slight rise in your sympathetic nervous system. As you breathe out, it's parasympathetic nervous system. Right? Now, the other thing is I want everybody to sit up nice and straight. And we're going to do two breaths. Right? So I'm just going to go three, two, one. I take, I take a pretty big breath through your mouth. And I want you to notice what part of your thorax actually moves. And then we're going to follow it with a big breath through our nose. Okay? So mouth first, then nose. But I want you to notice what part moves. Okay, three, two, one, in through the mouth and out. And now in through the nose and out. Anybody notice the difference? So nose is more belly, more diaphragm. It's the bottom of the rib cage. That's diaphragmatic breathing, right? You have neurons in your brain that are watching every breath. And when you mouth breathe and you activate up here, it activates a stress response. And when you're nasal breathing and down here, it's the relaxation response. Okay, so I very quickly need to finish off. Macro recovery is about sleep. Amazing shit happens in your brain every time you are asleep. The glymphatic system clears it out of toxins. And we know now that people who have chronically bad sleep significantly increase the risk of Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. They also increase the risk of heart disease, 
of, of, of a lot of different cancers, of type 2 diabetes, of obesity. They destroy their cognitive performance. And for the gentleman in the room, three nights bad sleep and your balls shrink. <laughs> I kid you not, measurable changes in the size of your nuts after three nights bad sleep and your testosterone resembles that of somebody that is 10 years older. Now that I have your attention, gentlemen, <laughs> let's talk about the short-term consequences. We know that if you're sleep deprived, you will perform cognitively about the same as people who are legally drunk. But when they do these assessments, they ask the people how they went. The pissed people go, I probably screwed up. The sleep deprived people think they went well. So all around this country, you have people turning up at work, performing like pissed people, thinking they're doing a good job, right? <laughs> the other thing um, that's really important is that when you have bad sleep, ghrelin, your hunger hormone is increased. Anybody notice they, they eat more? And because cortisol is higher as well, you crave sugary, fatty, salty foods. And at the same time, leptin is reduced, and it has a powerful drive on physical activity in the brain. So after a bad night's sleep, not only are you likely to eat more, you're more likely to sit on your arse all day long. You're less likely to do a workout, which means that you're less able to handle the stresses of the day's events because exercise is the best stress buster there is. That means you're more likely to go home stressed and soothe your anxiety with either shit food or alcohol, which both impact your sleep that night and then it's Groundhog Day. Does that make sense? And lots of our clients will be like that. Um, so quick one just before I finish, rule of three. Caffeine, any caffeine drinkers in the room? Oh, yes. Anybody tells you you shouldn't drink coffee or tea, I think it's full of crap. Um, uh, because the polyphenols and the flavonoids are actually really good for your heart and your brain and your cells. However, it's a brain stimulant. We need to remember that. They give it to fighter pilots in times of war. And the half-life for the average person is about six hours, right? Now, some people are faster processors, but general rule, no more than 250 milligrams. That's about three cups of coffee. And try to be done eight hours before you go to bed. Those who have four or more exposures a day, and don't remember, it's not just coffee, energy drinks, um, it's also diet drinks, chocolate has some caffeine in it. If you have four or more exposures, and particularly having the last one in the afternoon, you will have caffeine in your brain at stimulant levels 24-7, 365 days a year. And people wonder why they struggle with sleep. Now, the second one is routine. Everybody remembers little kids and what happens when you take them out of routine. They go feral, right? Your brain is a little bit like that. You mess with your circadian rhythms, right? Now, so the, the advice from sleep scientists is try to go to bed at the same time, give or take 15 minutes every night. Even more importantly, get up at the same time every morning, even on weekends. Don't shoot the messenger, people. Last one, your brain needs to know that your bedroom is a sleep sanctuary. It is where you go to sleep, and if you're lucky, you get a bit of oofty magoofty every now and then, right? <laughs> That it's not a place for televisions, for laptops, and mobile phones. Who has a mobile phone in the bedroom at night? Tell the truth and shame the deal. It's my alarm clock, isn't it? Buy a $10 alarm clock, you tight arse. So, oh, <laughs> we've now gone. I think this is a sign that I need to get off. Uh, that's fine. My last slide was, was a, a sad face. Um, look, this is the point, as a speaker, I'm supposed to create a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling between me and you and all that horse shit, right? <laughs> I'm not a motivational speaker, I'm a realist, and I have to finish with the bad news because it's real. And the bad news is that no one is coming, ever. Seriously, no one is coming to sort your shit out. No one is coming to get you an optimal physical and mental health, to make your role model for your kids or help you to achieve your goals, they're just not coming. This is all about you and the choices that you make every single day. Thank you.